All right, so welcome everybody. My name is Jessica Wright and I will be moderating today's event. I have been with Corning for almost six years now, spending about 70% of my time with campus and events. Um, I am managing the virtual learning series for the summer, so it's kind of my baby and I'm really excited about it. I'm excited to have all of you here. Um, for the most part, I manage our talent communities. So if you've ever been to our booth at a career fair or a various event, you'll have received follow-up emails and newsletters from me. Um, just a few housekeeping notes, everybody will be placed on mute, so we ask that you remain on mute for the duration of the presentation. Um, we do want this to be interactive and engaging, so please feel free to send questions in the chat um, or send them directly to me or to everybody, whichever you prefer, but um, we will have time for questions and we can do them throughout the presentation. Um, I'm really excited for today's presentation, which is an overview of Corning Environmental Technologies highlight, highlighting intellectual asset protection. So you have probably heard the Trump administration and the Obama administration before him talk about the problem of intellectual property theft by China. And Corning is a real life example of a company that is targeted by China and others for illegal IP theft and by our major competitors for legal competitive intelligence. This session is a short introduction to this topic, how we defend against it, and what you can do to participate in that defense. So with that, I'd like to introduce our producer, Jacqueline Damore, who works for um, in our Corning Environmental Technologies Division as an Intellectual Asset Project Manager. So Jackie's turning it over to you. Hi, Jessica, and hi, interns. Um, I just, I would like to just do a short introduction. Um, I came to Corning uh, 31 years ago now, and I came to Corning because it's kind of Mecca for ceramic engineers and material scientists. So that's why I originally joined Corning and what I originally uh, did for the first 10 or 15 years of my career. Uh, the neat thing about Corning is um, you can you can move around and you can do different things over time. So, um, you know, my journey was through a, a number of different jobs and roles and uh, my, my current role is um, focusing on protecting our intellectual assets. Uh, my previous job was in display doing this and now I've moved to the environmental division um, in the same role. So let me move on. Uh, this first slide is our information security slide and hopefully in your other presentations you'll hear people talk about this slide in terms of uh, the content that you're going to hear and um, how sensitive it is. So in this case um, this is fairly low sensitivity and but we do consider it internal information so I'd appreciate it if you uh, would like to use any of this content or uh, capture any of this content please gain my agreement before you um, take it outside of Corning's uh, systems. Um, so my topic today is intellectual asset protection and I'll tell you a little bit about what that means. Um, I'm going to talk about a case study that illustrates, um, you know, what misappropriation of intellectual property means. Um, I'm going to talk about um, human-centered intellectual asset protection. Um, how you can avoid when you work for Corning or another company like Corning, how you can avoid uh, violating uh, intellectual asset protection or information security uh, policies. Um, what employee and NDA obligations mean and, and how that applies uh, to employees. And uh, your Corning experience, uh, if you uh, if you are an intern, I'm going to talk about it as, as if you were doing intern projects. So first of all, Corning cares about this because we've made a tremendous investment in our technology over many, many years. Um, the company's been in existence 169 years, and we've invested many billions of dollars in uh, manufacturing, development, engineering, uh, so we're serious about protecting that investment. We don't want to give it away, and we don't want people. We don't want anybody stealing it from us. Um, we protect this our technology investments in two main ways. One is by patenting. So uh, this is a 
a, a legal arrangement where we can exclude others from practicing our technology. Uh, we have uh, over 13,000 granted patents worldwide. We're, we're, we are a leading company um, in, in, and an innovator. And we have many, many more patents in various stages of prosecution uh, before they become a, a granted patent. Uh, the way that we defend our uh, patent rights is through uh, prosecuting any uh, entities that infringe. So if someone makes the same product or uses the same recipe and we can detect it, we, um, we will send our lawyers after that company and uh, we'll have, we'll have a, um, you know, a legal challenge. For trade secrets, it's a little bit different because uh, trade secrets have to be kept secret in order for them to be considered in the intellectual property of a company. So we use layers of defense to protect our trade secrets, starting with our values and our code of conduct. Um, we also have policies, trainings, and audits, um, process controls, and technical controls. And I'll talk about some of those um, later in the presentation. Uh, we train our employees and our partners uh, to prevent the accidental disclosure of our trade secrets, and we will pursue legal action um, if there is intentional misappropriation detected. So what is a trade secret? Um, here are some examples. Uh, product information uh, such as new products prior to release, anything that's um, you know, prior to publication is a trade secret. Uh, research and development programs, technology roadmaps, research reports, engineering reports, um, inventions prior to publication of patents, uh, recipes, um, technologies, manufacturing processes, custom equipment, and all of that kind of stuff. All of those things are, are more technology-based, but we, we also consider sensitive business information a, tech, a trade secret. So um, five-year plans, um, customer lists, vendor lists, pricing, any ongoing litigation or M&A activity, all of those things are kept secret as well. There are lots of consequences if, if our secret information does leak out. Uh, competitors can gain information and, and competitive and get, uh, advantage against Corning. It could jeopardize IP for current projects. So anything that, that goes into the public domain uh, can no longer be patented or protected uh, as a trade secret. Um, it could be used as evidence against us in litigation. So information that we accidentally disclose can be used against us. Uh, and we can, and we lose our, our ability to control our information um, if we accidentally disclose it. Um, I also want to mention here, um, you know, how we might lose this information. So, you know, who do we lose these you know, trade secrets to and how do we lose them? Um, that's my job to prevent. And the various ways are, you know, some examples are accidental disclosure um, because people make mistakes um, through third parties that we share information with. Um, we could be the victim of cyber theft or hacking by, um, by a nation state, for example. Uh, we could have misappropriation by insiders and we could um, also lose it uh, through competitive intelligence information gathering. And those are really the two things that I'm gonna talk about next is one, the case study of, uh, of a company that was the victim of insider misappropriation. And then I'll talk about competitive, you know, the more um, routine competitive intelligence that companies go after. So um, this case study involves a company called um, American Semiconductor, AMSC. And it, it was a company formed in 1987 by some MIT smart guys, smart people. And they acquired a wind turbine control system company in 2006 and really grew their business. Uh, most of their work was associated with 
um, selling customers software for wind turbines. And this was a time frame when wind turbines and wind energy was really taking off, uh, both in this country and in other countries, including China. And this company's major customer was a company called Sinovel, located in China. And in 2010, uh, this company, Sinovel, uh, faced a very expensive upgrade for all of its turbines or the majority of its turbines that were deployed. And uh, they had to buy this upgrade from AMSC. And they, they were not, um, they were not happy with how much that was going to cost them. So they took advantage of, of a uh, person, a young engineer uh, from AMSC who was working with Sinovel closely and had been on business travel uh, deploying these things in China for years and had relationship with, with people in the Sinovel company um, as a customer. And this engineer had had a big ego and had, you know, um, a penchant for partying. <laughs> he he liked to go out and enjoy himself. Uh, he, uh, Sinovel, uh, the people that he dealt with at Sinovel exploited that, and they assessed that his loyalties were for sale. And in fact, um, he did sell the company's proprietary software to Sinovel. Uh, for about $20,000 and a five-year employment contract. So as a result, AMSC suffered the loss over, over time of over a uh, billion dollars and more than 600 jobs. So, you know, it, it decimated this company. The company survives, but it's not the company it could have been um, if this event had not happened. Uh, just a couple of years ago, a jury in Madison, Wisconsin, I'm not sure why it was prosecuted in Wisconsin, but um, that's where, where this case happened. Um, they found this Chinese company guilty on all counts of misappropriation, um, and they were fined uh, roughly $57 million, uh, paid over a couple of years. So I think they're still in progress with their payments. But if you compare, you know, that payment, $57 million, to the loss of over a billion dollars and, and all of those U.S. jobs, um, you know, it doesn't seem like much satisfaction. And nobody gets their business back, nobody gets their technology back, uh, and no one gets their jobs back. So, you know, this picture that I have here of the blue sky and the wind turbine and those little animals there are horses and they're not going back in the barn. The horse is out of the barn and it's gone forever. Um, you know, so there's, there's a lot of takeaways from this case. Uh, the, you know, AMC was a big loser. You know, they're never gonna be the company that they would have been. Uh, the engineer was a loser, so he went to jail. Um, he made, you know, and I'm quoting something that he said in his in his case, he made the biggest mistake of his life. You know, some of his reasons were that, you know, all the business trips to China, his marriage was failing, um, and he felt undervalued by the company. You know, so, so it's the opposite sort of view of the situation as the company presented of him. But, you know, the bottom line is he, he did go to jail and he kind of ruined his life. Um, or at least for, for a while. And the company Sinovel, they weren't really a winner either. Even though they cheated and they, you know, took advantage of this situation, uh, and they did win the, the ability to use the technology long term. Um, they're still a struggling company. They're a state-owned entity in China. Um, probably a lot of corruption involved. And their reputation has been... Um, really uh, impacted by by these events. You know, you you don't want to be the company that's in the news for doing this. And even if you're a Chinese state-owned entity, entity, this is not what you want to be known for. So um, I'm sure that there's a lot of folks involved who are ashamed of their involvement on that end as well. So, you know, key takeaways here from cases like this, 
is, is, is it, you just can't put the horse back in the barn. Um, it takes a long time and a lot of money. Um, you'll notice, I, I believe that it was um, 2011 when they detected, or actually they were informed by the FBI. They didn't even detect the loss of their own um, intellectual property. But it took them until from 2011 to 2018 to get a settlement. And the bottom line is nobody wins. Uh, we actually have a really good question there. So um, somebody asks, are they allowed to, or do they continue to use the stolen software? Yes. So part of the settlement is that they have access to what they stole. And they've incorporated it into the wind turbines that they're, you know, that they've been selling. So, you know, as this, because of this settlement, they don't have to take it out of what they've deployed. So it's, you know, at, it's a pretty cheap way actually to, to obtain technology. It's not, it, it's better if you don't get caught, but in this case they got caught and they were fined substantially. Corning has actually had this happen as well. Um, you know, it, it didn't take Corning down in the same way that it took down AMCS or AMSC. Uh, but we've, we have um, experienced uh, this kind of a event and we've gone to court in China and had a similar remedy. Any other questions? Um, I, I do have a good question, but I think you kind of answered it and it was more about um, how does any company or particularly Corning find out about any sort of trade secret theft. Yeah, um, so in this case, they found out because they were informed by the FBI. Um, and I think the FBI found out because another company had reported uh, something to the FBI uh, that they noticed when they purchased equipment from Sinovel. Um, in Corning's case, um, We found out uh, through other employees and investigations and, and also confidential, confidential informants. Um, so we've, we've discovered things that way. Uh, another avenue is through suppliers. Suppliers sometimes report this. Uh, for example, if they get an order of, of something that's associated with um, proprietary technology that Corning has ordered from them but in the past, uh, they might report that to us. So there's various ways to find out about it. Um, the, the thing that we find in common is that it's well after the fact, um, and it's very difficult to pursue um, evidence around it because of the uh, aging of that information. So it's difficult. Okay, I'm gonna move on and talk about the much more mundane topic of uh, competitive intelligence. Um, this, I put a quote here in case anybody recognizes this, it's around knowing your enemy. Um, and you know that comes from Sun Tzu, who they often quote for, uh, you know, for business reasons, the, the art of war. And a lot of these quotes apply uh, in business. So um, in the case of competitive intelligence, this is a real job. Uh, we have competitive intelligence people in Corning who do this on our behalf and collect information about com uh, companies that compete with us. And those competing companies also have people that work for them who collect intelligence about Corning. Um, and it's all about knowing your enemy uh, so that you can you know, plan your uh, plan your battles in business, right? So they use indirect sources of information such as financial filings and uh, publications, technical reports, and anything that's in the public domain. Anything that's in the public domain is fair game and perfectly legal to collect for these purposes. Um, they also use direct sources of information by trying to talk to our customers, our suppliers, partners, third-party partners, Current and ex-employees may be approached. Um, they may try to get product samples and 
do site surveillance where that's legal. Um, so yeah, people go out there with cameras and, um, you know, uh, thermal imaging devices and things like that to detect what's going on inside your facility, counting cars in the parking lot, um, you know, looking at what's on the loading docks and, and so forth. And yes, Corning does that. Uh, you know, we have an interest in understanding what's going on in our uh, competitors' locations, and we do that too. It's perfectly legal in most places. And uh, in order to protect against this kind of information gathering, we really need to be careful. We need to stop and uh, pause before we put something out there in public. We need to think about it and, and really um, make sure that we have the right conditions for sharing or for publication. And um, we need to restrict that to need to know only and really avoid pro providing our competitors with another piece to this puzzle of you know, what we are doing and how they can compete effectively against us. So IEP risk, whether it's uh, misappropriation through an insider or uh, loss of confidential information to competitive information gathering. It's, it's all about people and the intersection of people, confidential information, and th the desire of a third party to get it. Uh, people um, are, you know, they, they sometimes lack awareness of what the risk is and what the rules are to protect information. Sometimes they don't follow the rules intentionally. Sometimes they just make mistakes. Um, they often prioritize the results that they're, you know, working on and need to deliver over in protecting information on, or, or protecting information. Um, people are human. They like to talk about what they work on. They're excited about what they work on. They like to share their knowledge, um, but they can also be tricked and exploited, um, and they can be lured by rewards, as as in the case of the uh, AMSC engineer. One of the key concepts, and this sounds boring, but it's really important, is to mark and or to classify and mark documents appropriately. So in Corning, we have a number of different classifications for documents, including uh, Corning Public, Corning Restricted, uh, Corning Restricted Personal Data, and Special Control. Um, Corning Public will mark a document with the copyright year and uh, Corning Incorporated tag. And that means that that document has been reviewed and approved for public dissemination. Um, if it's marked Corning Restricted, that means it needs to stay in-house. Um, we also have some extensions that we can use uh, to further um, direct people who use the who use our documents uh, regarding uh, you know how they need to be treated so some key ones here are confidential under NDA so if we share uh, information with a third party under NDA we need to add this marking if it's um, information that needs to be controlled internally uh, we can add this this additional tag controlled content and then I'll skip over, to, well, Corning personal data is for uh, obviously personal data, things to do with individuals. Um, but Corning special control similarly has a uh, confidential under NDA and a not for external distribution, um, keep, you know, which instructs people to keep it internal and, and can be leveraged by uh, systems and processes to prevent the um, external sending of that information. Uh, we do have a tool internally that um, allows that that automatically pops up when you're in a document and you want to go save it or print it, and it forces us to choose the the classification that best fits the content. Um, so this is really a fundamental, and I think uh, you'll see this in Corning as well as uh, most other companies. We leverage in a variety of different tools to and, and different security measures to prevent and monitor for information leakage. Uh, one is data loss prevention. This is a uh, enterprise-wide tool that's hooked to our IT systems. 
and uh, we leverage classification as well as keywords and other rules to uh, monitor information flow um, as it moves uh, across system boundaries. And uh, if it if it um, triggers one of those rules, then it requires um, review and pot potentially intervention to uh, stop any further egress of information or to remediate the loss of what might have already happened. And, and that applies to email as well as um, removable media and uh, cloud applications, for example. So we're monitoring that way with those kinds of tools. Uh, we also have um, input output port control. So the the hands down most popular way to for uh, for a misappropriation event to occur is for an employee to download information onto a removable media device. And so we have controls in place to uh, limit the ability to, to use that as an avenue of exfiltration of information. Uh, we also uh, have an access control, uh, which, which means we limit access based on need to know, and we routinely uh, review access to our data repositories to make sure that that stays current. So th that as people move from job to job within the company, that they don't accumulate access over time and, and have access that is in excess of what they need. We also educate our employees through phishing campaigns to uh, minimize our exposure to um, all kinds of different phishing. Phishing is the preferred mechanism for uh, companies, or not companies, but entities, uh, hacker entities that want to uh, get into our network. Usually, um, or it's much easier for them to get in if they can uh, gain credentials through uh, employees being um, lured by a phishing email or a phishing uh, uh, message. It's, that's much easier than a brute force hack, and, and it's the most common way that, um, that companies are hacked, in fact. So physical security is another area. So we have all kinds of uh, physical security measures, both to keep our people and our equipment safe, as, as well as our um, information. Um, and mobile controls, uh, the proliferation of smart devices um, also presents uh, challenges for information protection. And we have a number of different uh, things that we do with our mobile devices to prevent the loss of information through, through those things. So these are some examples. Yeah. Sorry, we do have a few questions. Um, if they're to do with the tools, go ahead. Um, so one back into like on the previous slide with the approval process. Um, what does the approval process for public disclosure look like? Ah, okay. So um, each division in Corning has their own approval process for. Uh, moving something from an internal document to a Corning publication. And it's reviewed by um, a group of people who are assigned uh, by that division, uh, marketing and communication group typically, to, uh, to look at it from um, their perspective. So that may be a technology person, an IP person, um, sometimes me as an intellectual asset protection person. Uh, and certainly um, from the viewpoint of sales and, and commercial as well, because we, we want to put our best foot forward in publications and make sure that we don't, um, you know, for example, present ourselves poorly, either, either through the quality of a presentation that might be, go out there or, um, you know, a picture that shows something that, um, that doesn't that, that might be like a housekeeping issue in a, in a wherever wherever the picture is taken those kinds of things so we review it from a bunch of different perspectives and then it gets approved and then it can be um, changed to Corning Public was there any other questions
Okay. Uh, I have a quick question about the mobile control, if you don't mind. Sure. Yeah. So, uh, a mobile being such, uh, I would say, basic human need as of now, how do you control it? So, like, whenever someone is going in the office, do you collect it and they can only access it during certain times? Or, like, how does that work? So, again, this is an area that is um, a big challenge because, you know, as you just said, it's almost like uh, it's everyone considers their fo phone a very necessary device to have on them at all times now. That wasn't the case 10 years ago. So this is something that has just evolved, you know, uh, you know, recently, in my opinion, or in my in my viewpoint. <laughs> but it's um, it's a challenge and our divisions are doing it in different ways. We have we have some overarching rules about it at the corporate level, but each division is managing it differently in their various um, plant locations. So typically people are allowed to use their mobile devices fairly freely in the office environments. So knowledge workers uh, such as yourselves would be able to carry their devices in office environments and use them freely, uh, but not take photos with them. So we're not, we don't allow um, pictures of whiteboards or pictures um, in the office environment either. In the plant environments, we do a, an array of different um, protection mechanisms. Uh, in display, they are uh, checking in and che people are uh, go through a entry exit procedure where a sticker is placed over the, the cameras on both sides and on the way in and it's inspected on the way out. Um, they also go through a metal detector to make sure you're not carrying extra devices. So, um, you know, that's probably the most stringent um, in terms of checking. Uh, there's also plants like in fiber who don't allow any phones at all in the manufacturing uh, spaces. And in Corning Environmental, where I am now, the, the policy that we're, we've deployed is uh, no use in the manufacturing areas. So you can have the phone in your pocket or in your bag or concealed somewhere um, you know, and carrying it, but you can't take it out. You can't have it in your hand um, when you're on the manufacturing floor. You have to go to a cell phone uh, green zone to be able to use it, which might be a break area or a common area. So I wish I had a, you know, single answer for the whole company, but we haven't evolved to that yet. And then one more question on just about classifying documents. How do employees understand what goes under each safety name? So is there additional training aside from what's on this slide or anything like that? Yes, and, and I can tell you also that this, um, this scheme is probably going to be updated later in the year. And we'll have an additional um, we'll have an additional classification called internal uh, and it'll be a little bit more intuitive. Right now, um, you know, it is, it's in um, training that every employee has to take uh, on a, I think it's a two year cycle. So this slide or something like this slide is included in required training for all employees. Um, there's additional resources available for, for people to learn this. Um, one thing that we really struggle with is differentiating between what we're calling the restricted level and the special control level because the special control level um, is the highest level of classification and um, you know what what we find our employees really struggle with is where that boundary is. And so that's a continuing challenge in educating our employees. And then one final question for this slide. Um, how have these restrictions changed with the current situation? Um, would, you mean, do you mean the classification or these, or these kinds of controls? Um, maybe both, but maybe with like more employees working remotely and not being uh, in corning offices and things like that. I think that's where right, we're going. Right. So yeah, um, that, the, the biggest change, I think, 
is really, um, you know, we see an uptick in people sending things to their personal emails, which is a no, no. So uh, they're doing that for a couple different reasons in this kind of work environment and mainly because they are trying to uh, transfer something to their home account, which is hooked up more smoothly to their printer. Uh, so it's for practical reasons like that, that, that we've seen most of that. Um, also, um, you know, we've gone through some layoffs and people feel threatened. And when they do, they try to, um, you know, they, they send information out of the company in order to use it for their future purposes, um, either for, for work backgrounds and resume writing or for reference when they move on. So those are the kinds of things typically that we detect in uh, times like this. Um, I'm trying to think what else. Um, yeah, um, the, you know, the, we can't detect certain things. There's a certain level of trust that we assign to our knowledge workers who are allowed to work from home. And we educate our employees uh, about those expectations. And, and we do have to trust them because there are ways around some of our controls. Um, but we, you know, we, we, we hope that uh, people aren't going to those great extents that they need to, to circumvent our controls. Awesome. That's for now for questions. Okay. Anything else? I'll, I'll go on to the next slide. So, um, you know, I, I want to just give you a list of practical behaviors and expectations uh, for all employees and some th things that you need to know if you're in our environment. Uh, we do expect everyone to wear their badge visibly. So when you're in a Corning facility, it should be easy to see someone's badge either uh, you know, on a lanyard or uh, on their clothing. And you should be able to see their photograph and their name very visibly. Um, we do expect people to always mark documents with the appropriate classification. That, that is, again, a fundamental and how we claim ownership of that information. Um, we only store Corning information on Corning devices or systems. It is forbidden to take information out of the Corning environment and transfer it uh, in an unauthorized way or to a personal um, system, account, whatever. We expect folks to keep, keep their work areas clean. Um, if you're familiar with the 5S concept, we apply that also to information security. And we, we also expect people to keep their devices uh, secured. So their phones, their PCs and so forth to treat them um, you know, with uh, security in mind. Uh, we use... Uh, we want people only to print really to Corning printers. Uh, we have controls on the printers to prevent people from sending jobs to the printer and then just leaving them on the printer. You have to go and swipe your badge to get it to come out of the printer and take it away. So printing has been a challenge in the work at home environment. Um, what we're telling people is when they do print Corning content at home that they need to save it up and not put it in their household trash. They will need to save it up and take it back to the Corning facility when, they're, when they go back to the Corning facility and put it through the uh, secure shredders. So it, hopefully people are minimizing what they're printing at home. Um, phishing emails, beware of phishing and, and stay educated in terms of how, how to avoid that. We have a fish me button on our email that they can easily report uh, phishing emails uh, using that mechanism. And uh, to get approval for any information that uh, needs to be shared externally. And some do nots or some, some things to avoid are using your cell phone on the shop floor, the manufacturing floor. Uh, follow the local plant rules. So again, it does vary in uh, the different divisions in Corning as to how they're controlling that. Um, don't take your, or don't use your cell phone to take any photographs at work or of any work content or, or of your computer screens or anything like that. That's forbidden. 
um, and don't use um, texting, uh, apps, unapproved apps, or social media for corning business. Uh, SMS texting is not secure, and a record of it is in the phone company's, uh, you know, systems, whether that's in the U.S. or elsewhere. So that's not secure. And certainly, um, any kind of apps that are on your phone that are not uh, sanctioned by Corning are not approved for doing any Corning business. Uh, we, you know, the biggest one uh, really is not to transfer business documents to any non-Corning accounts or systems. And that includes uh, cloud accounts, Box, Dropbox, all of that. Um, don't upload documents to any web locations or download uh, to removable media. And uh, don't take hard copy uh, as a way to circumvent those rules. So that's really, you know, some of the big ones. And then I would think that, yep, Sorry. you got a question? That's okay. Question? Question for the end or? No, that's okay. If there's a question on this stuff, go ahead. Yep. Um, so somebody asked, how could you tell if you have gotten a phishing email or if it is a normal email? Well, so some things to look for are to hover over the, the sender uh, address. Sometimes what you see in the, you know, what you see won't be what shows up in the URL. And so, you know, the URL from American Express might say some gobbledygook long, uh, not Amex looking address. Uh, a lot of times phishing emails have an urgency, like they're they're uh, threatening you with with something. You're going to lose your access to something if you don't respond with your credentials or log into this link um, or open this document, uh, or you're going to get a reward. So you know sometimes it'll say you you know entice you with something. Um, so so be suspicious of that. Uh, be suspicious if there's a lot of misspellings or it just doesn't look right or professional to you. Uh, so that's a common hallmark of a phishing email. Um, and some of them are really, really good. I've been getting a lot lately from, um, you know, one one was like from uh, Apple or I think it was Apple that that was saying your your account is going to be discontinued if you don't respond to this and update some information. And and it looked real, and I knew that I had not done anything to um, get this email solicitation recently. So I was suspicious. Um, you know, another one like that might be a package delivery notification. Um, so you and and try to follow a tracking log, uh, or try to it, it tells you to follow a tracking log. Um, so if if you know you haven't. Um, ordered anything and expected a delivery, you know, you'd be suspicious of that, even if it does look like a real company. So um, the answer is be suspicious. And in Corning, we have this nice little feature, uh, this phishing button, the, the email will be automatically sent to a team in the IT organization in the cybersecurity group who will analyze it and respond back to us to let us know whether it was a real, um, phishing uh, email or a or a real business document or 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 potentially just a spam um, so they'll they'll classify that for us and respond to us and then if it is a real business document that you know is legit we can go back into our deleted email and retrieve that um, if you're not, if you don't have those tools it's a lot harder <laughs> Uh, sorry, I did not interrupt. Um, but we actually have like a real life example from somebody who recently joined Corning. Um, he did say that somebody was working from home and was actually um, breaking one of these rules um, in the do not, and the employee refused to do it. So he said, and I think this is also really important that people just understand that you're responsible for your own actions. So the so and so said to do it, and so and so said it was okay is not um, right. acceptable. You are responsible for your own actions. So I thought that was a really good point to bring up. Yep, that's a good point. 
Um, not all employees are uh, equal advocates of following the rules. And I talked about that human-centered uh, IEP risk earlier. Um, some people prioritize the need to get something done and get it done now over following the rules. And so, you know, if you do get guidance from an employee to circumvent these rules, um, please don't follow that temptation because you ultimately would be responsible for your own actions. And I think we're good to move on. Okay. So the last thing, I, I believe this is the last thing that I'm gonna talk about, the last topic is, what does an employee NDA mean? So typically when we think about NDAs, it's with a third party. It's between two companies, which um, governs the confidentiality requirements of the information that's shared with that third party. Um, when it's the employee, so employees sign a document, a confidentiality document on day one of employment. And a lot of times we don't see it again for a very long time. So I always include this reminder in trainings that I do because you know you you sign this to get the job and you start working and you forget all about it so what is that piece of paper that you signed and what does it mean um, it's typically called a non-disclosure agreement but the actual document title can vary uh, depending on the legal entity that you work for or the region um, a common you know some common points are uh, this document, as Corning writes it, is a perpetual agreement, so it doesn't end with separation from Corning. Uh, if you work for Corning and you sign an NDA, everything that you uh, were exposed to uh, that is Corning restricted during that time period is subject to um, non-disclosure uh, and confidentiality. So just because your employment with Corning ends doesn't mean that you're now free to, to share information that you learned. So it pro prohibits disclosure of any Corning technical or business information in any form, including verbal uh, through, or through the provision of services, uh, you know, through consulting or, or whatever after, after employment with Corning. Um, it, it prohibits advertisement of Corning know-how or information for personal gain. So, you know, if you have Corning experience and you want to put that on a resume, for example, uh, you could talk about the skills that you've gained or the experience that you've gained, but not necessarily the proprietary know-how of Corning. Uh, you don't own that and you can't uh, take it away and use it for the benefit of another company or for your own personal gain um, either through uh, future employment or for yourself. Um, and, you, and you can't um, share information with third parties, including former Corning employees. So one tricky thing we have going on sometimes is, you know, a Corning employee might retire or move on to another job. And uh, employees that have worked with that person may maintain a relationship after that person leaves Corning. So the person that's still with Corning is can no longer share any Corning information with that ex-employee. Um, that specifically, uh, that employee who signed an NDA during their employment is responsible for, to protect what they learned during their employment. When that employment ended, they are no longer under NDA, so current active employees are not authorized to share with them. Does that make sense? Um, hopefully that was clear. Any questions about NDAs? Yes, um, we do have a few questions that kind of came through. So okay. one, um, specifically about NDAs, do the NDAs expire after a certain number of years after employment? Uh, no. So again, the obligation is perpetual. So it means that, it, it doesn't mean that it's active forever. It means the information that you learned is, is forever subject to this agreement. So five years after your employment with Corning, if you learned, you know, a certain amount, or, you know, if you learned about some Corning uh, restricted information, um, five years after your employment, you're still not free to disclose that to anybody else. 
So you're forever beholden to protect that information. Um, if you want to use it, you have to get Corning's permission. Perfect. Um, so back to the case study. So the root cause cited was that the employee didn't feel valued. What does Corning actively do to remedy this concern for their employees? So um, that goes back to, and hopefully you attended the session on Corning values. Um, Corning uh, lives its values and values its employees. And uh, one of the best ways for us not to lose our intellectual property and information is to have um, employees that do feel valued. Because, you know, disgruntled employees, unhappy employees are, are risky employees. So we do a lot to, um, to make our employees happy employees. Um, but, but, you know, it, that, that said, um, you know, this is a business. Um, so there are boundaries to that. It's not, it doesn't mean that they, that employees get whatever they want. Um, you know, they have employees have to deliver and um, they're rewarded for delivering. Um, and Corning, Corning treats employees fairly. Yep, definitely. And then just an FYI for everybody on the call, that values presentation will be sent out at the end of this week for people to review if they would like. Um, Okay, couple more questions, and this has been great. So, how do employees get benefits from filing patents through Corning other than having their names on the application? So, it varies by country, and in the U.S., I'll just answer about the U.S. Um, the U.S. does not require that, and the other document that you sign on day one of employment is your rights to inventions. So, you assign your rights to an invention, uh, anything that you do that's a work product that, 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 that you invent during your tenure with Corning um, is owned by Corning. So you get $2 um, and a commemorative uh, $2 bill with Thomas Jefferson's face on it. Um, Thomas Jefferson invented the patent system, so uh, that's the meaning of that. Um, and you get recognition. Uh, it does count towards promotion. Uh, opportunities if you're in the science and technology areas. So, um, so that's the short answer. Uh, you don't get monetary uh, rewards for, um, you know, you don't get extra uh, royalties or anything. Cool. Um, and I think that is it. There was a question, I think we touched upon it, but maybe um, if there's anything to elaborate, um, but how do companies, in this case, Corning, find out about employees performing insider trading? Insider trading is a whole different thing, and that is, um, so one of the things that we do as, as um, salaried employees on an annual basis, I think it is, is we have to certify a number of different things that are related to um, fraud or securities violations. So there's a there's a certification, like I said, that we have to sign every year that educates us in terms of what are those kinds of violations and what kinds of actions employees um, might that that might constitute those violations. Um, and and it's a whole list. And we have to read them and acknowledge uh, or certify that we have not done any of those things. Include and, and it speaks specifically to insider trading as well. Awesome. Um, well, that just double checking. That is it for questions. Um, okay. So thank I you. Have two, I, oh, I have two ahead. more slides. I forgot. Oh, okay. um, these are. <laughs> This one is specific for interns, and then I think it's the wrap-up slide. So I, I do speak here to, like, if, if you have to produce something um, as a result of your intern experience, as evidence of your experience, um, or for credit at your university, um, we have some examples of uh, what's okay and what's not okay to include in, in those kinds of um, uh, reports or whatever you have to do. So certainly you can do any, any public information 
um, general descriptions of your responsibilities or your accomplishments and what your role was. Uh, what we don't like is um, internal project names, org charts, uh, detailed objectives that disclose um, our activities, uh, specific improvement numbers, um, percentages, or those kinds of charts with actual numbers. Um, unapproved pictures taken inside Corning facilities or of Corning information, uh, those, those things are not allowed. Um, we, in some cases, we would approve pictures if necessary, uh, but they need to be reviewed and uh, engineering drawings or screenshots of engineering drawings. So those are the kinds of things that are typically not acceptable to include in reports. And it also applies to resumes. And then this is my final slide. And I just want to wrap up with a couple key points. Corning and companies like Corning have a lot to lose. We are targeted and we take information security seriously. Uh, IEP risk or information security risk is all about human vulnerabilities and our employees are expected to be aware and not only observe the rules, um, you know, but to think, uh, to stop, think, and, and be proactive in preventing information loss. Okay, so that is it. And if there's any final questions, let me know. Otherwise, we can, we can end, Jessica. Yeah, um, I believe you have answered all of the questions. So I just want to say this was, even as a, somebody who's been at Corning for six years, this was such an interesting presentation. Um, I love all of the questions. I think I speak for um, everybody when I say thank you so, so much. And we really appreciate your time. Um, again, to everybody, this will be recorded. So we will be sending it out at the end of the week. And I thank you all for attending. Thank you. And thanks again, Jackie. Okay, take care. Thanks, bye.